you fulfil lots of different, you know, composer and a writer, and you're presenting more recently, especially with uh, the series of uh, programmes on BBC Four. I mean, in terms of what you think of yourself as, if you were to, to choose one of those, what what would you kind of most likely feel of that, say? I've always just thought I'm, you know, money wanted, anything considered, basically. <laughs> it's the, the jobs that come your way when you're a freelancer, the more widely you can offer stuff, the more likely you're going to get some work. Um, I think I always started life knowing music was going to be quite important. And that's one reason I picked this film. Because when I was about 13, uh, younger, if I went to the cinema and saw a film, I could hear the music in my head so strongly. And I don't know if you find this as well, children as well. If you hear a piece of music, can you still remember it when you go away from the cinema or go away from the telly again? Yeah. And when you do that, that's your brain starting to shape round the idea of music telling you stories. So that side of things, I think, was always going to be part of what I did. But when I first went to university, I studied drama because I didn't think I could make it as a musician. I, I never really properly studied music. I got grade five piano. Anybody here got grade five piano? Oh, we have Ooh, got Yep, there's a few yeah, hands. Other, Anybody yeah. got grade four? Grade three? Yeah, it's grade two. Grade one? Great. Keep it up, folks. That's all I can say. I played the piano really for therapy because I could play, I could hear music in my head and I could hear a tune and then play it on the piano. So I would sit at the piano and I'd play for an hour just doing my own stuff. And all through my teens, I just got better and better at making music up. So when I went to university, as I say, I went to study drama, but I found I was also doing a lot of music for shows. And I became an actor musician when I left, and then a musical director. And then eventually fell into being a silent film pianist. And this was the place that made me a silent film pianist. In fact, this very space here. Uh, way back in the very, very early 80s, where um, you had to audition to become a silent film pianist at the National Film Theatre, and your audition was to play to a film you hadn't seen <coughs> and play the whole thing. And that was kind of pretty pretty good to find you could do that. That was a, a, an extraordinary kind of And jump. that is a discipline that you've continued with. So, I mean, I mean, that's one of the things I think people are always really curious about. Do you get a chance to watch the film beforehand more often than not, or are you truly responding to the film that's playing? I do love playing a film I've not seen before if I know it's going to be good. So actually sitting watching a movie and playing it at the same time, it's like automatic writing. The film's going into your head and you're going, oh, wow, that's amazing. A uh, big open countryside, whoomph, you open up the countryside right down to one single person talking to another one, yunk, you pull it right back in again. It's, it's something I think that you... You enjoy as a workout. Paul Merton, for all the fact that he's as well known as he is and does Have I Got News For You and all the rest of it, does the comedy store every Sunday night. And the reason for that is that it's a mental workout for him because he walks on stage not knowing what he's going to do. And then for two hours, he's brilliantly funny. That's what I find with playing films I've not seen. For two hours, I sit and play music I've never heard before. And I, if I was to plan it, I couldn't do it. So it's a very different discipline then. If you're, if you're, because sometimes you'll score music for a particular film, mm -hmm. and other time you're just accompanying a film that you've mm -hmm. not seen. That's a very different discipline, actually, isn't it? Yeah, I found it quite hard to compose for film to begin with. Although I've done a lot of TV and uh, a lot of early film, but not having the audience there was a problem, because it's the audience that keeps you playing. It's the audience. It's a, the awareness that you've got to try and click with them that makes you keep thinking, no, I haven't quite got this yet. Yeah, that's, no, I've got to get, so, yeah, uh, and you actually quite often come down to single notes. You come down to a single line of melody. Another thing I learned from Railway Children, um, the tune for this film will not leave your head after you've left the cinema. It's only five notes, and yet, whoa, did you feel I, that just went down the back of my neck like that, all the way down to the bottom of my spine? That's brilliant film composition, you know? You've sort of, you've done the job of making something memorable in as small a number of notes as possible. And that's what I learned with not having an audience there for when I was scoring to films, is what you're trying to do is actually, for yourself, is get more with less. So when um, we asked you to choose a film as your screen epiphany, did the Railway Children come very quickly, or were there other films you'd thought about? 
It came pretty quickly, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about the producers, because the producers of film has always had a big effect on me. The first film I ever saw, which I think was incredibly influential on me, was Mary Poppins. Although there's a link, I think, between <coughs> Mary Poppins and this movie. Um, and as you get older, the films that actually mean something to you come back again and again and again. So it's very hard. It's like asking somebody their you know, top one film of yeah. all time. Yeah, and those are both very, films very where music is incredibly important, actually, isn't it? Yeah. Most of the films, I think, that had an effect on me, music is very, very important and used very well. But this one did it because, and um, this is something the adults will get, children you'll get later, I promise. <laughs> it's about that thing of learning to grow up because you understand there's things you're not being told. And that is what I think is great about the railway children. I grew up in a <coughs> fairly repressive house in that it was quite... We were very churchy. Nobody ever argued with anybody else. It was very quiet. We all sat with our head in books. So I was never told anything when I was growing up. No bad stuff was ever open to me at all. And I can remember going to see this film, and the children, all the way through the first half, do not know what the awful thing is that's happened to yeah. them. And I just loved that sense of being there. As I say, it's, I was 12 when I saw it. And that thing of watching kids slowly, slowly, slowly coming to realise that they're their own bosses, they've got their own lives to lead, and they can run a situation. They don't have to be led through a situation. They can actually take it over themselves. And then Bobby's maturity is fantastic because the very last line of the film for me, which I won't say because it will give it all away, that last line is her understanding what maturity actually is because... It, it, it involves the words, we and nobody else is needed right now. And yeah. actually, you know, if, if their lives had stayed the way that it, you know, it had been expected to and they hadn't had the opportunity to travel to Yorkshire yeah. and actually be really kind of liberated despite the terrible, you know, sort of um, stuff that's going on you know, sort of with their parents, mm. actually, you know, it, I mean, from their point of view, it's a very liberating experience because they properly are allowed to become children as mm. well as you know, growing up as Oh, well. yes, there's a lot of play in there. Bernard Cribbins is a great child man. He's a, that's what he's always done all his yeah. life. Is he's understood children at a very, very basic level. So everything he does is incredibly accessible to kids. So as soon as they meet Perks, they've got a whole life which is theirs and nobody else's. And I love trains. I will make no bones about it. So actually the whole idea that you get your own railway <coughs> when you go up there and everybody knows you and everybody's reacting to you and everybody's talking to you. Beautiful. I mean, just a they're beautiful They're proper working idea. locomotives they're using in the film, aren't they? And I think yeah. some of them are still, <coughs> they are. still around today. If you go up to Keithley in Yorkshire, the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway, that's where all this was shot. You can go through the tunnel. You can go past the fence where the kids are sitting. Um, they still make a very big thing of it, and rightly so. Three Chimneys, the cottage they go to, is still there. You can go and see that. And also... Now, I think, you know, there's a kind of sense that we go to see steam railways all the time, and they're very, very good, and they've just had a lot of money spent on this. This film's 40 years old. At the time, this, film, this railway had only just been reopened, so they were working with the absolute basics they got. And Lionel Jeffries, which I still can't get over, the best thing about this film, and I will shut up in a minute, I promise, the best thing about this film is that Lionel Jeffries brought to it a real director's perspective. And it's his first time directing. First time. It? But it's as if every film, and he'd made so many before then as an actor, he'd taken just what he wanted from all the directors he'd worked with. And the great daddy, my daddy moment, you'll notice, when you're watching it really carefully, has got every trick in the book. It's got long focus, it's got slow-mo, it's got a dri a sound being drifted out of the picture, it's got a freeze frame, like a, like a, p a picture postcard. It's got absolutely everything. And this is what you find with the way that he shot the, the railway. It looks Edwardian. It looks like it's running now. And I think that is the other thing I noticed at the time. I was deep inside that world, same way as I was with Mary Poppins. And I, at the time, I was growing up on an estate, a council estate in Essex. So this kind of world of Edwardian was beautiful. You know, oh, wow, gosh, I'd love to live in those places. And yet this film for me was the Mary Poppins kids growing up. The Mary Poppins kids had had everything, and magic, yep, yep. and Mary Poppins, and Dick Van Dyke, and everything had worked out for them. Now was when they were going to have to learn that life doesn't go that way. And 
they were almost like the same kids, a bit older, same as I was, now having to deal with their mum crying for a reason they don't understand. Now that, I think, is... And if you haven't seen it before, I really envy you. It's such a great film. And we talk about, you say about, about, about the kids in the film, one thing I think that's quite interesting in terms of behind the scenes is that, so there are three children in the film, and the eldest daughter, Jenny Agatha, is actually two years younger in real life than the middle child. Yes. So, so Sally Thompson, who plays the middle daughter, um, was playing, I think, an 11-year-old, but she actually was 20 at the Yeah, time. she had a sports car. And, and, um, yeah. and, they, and, and, they, and I think she had to sign a contract saying she wouldn't smoke or drink, yeah. she wouldn't drive her sports car, she wouldn't be seen with her boyfriend. The crew didn't know that she was as old as she was. No. Um, and apparently Bernard, Bernard and Crimmins used to often kind of like sort of catch her sort of smoking behind the scenes and <laughs> stuff and used to have to kind of sort of um, <laughs> warn her that Lionel was in the water. Lionel was around, you know. yeah. Um, also, the boy, Gary, I can't remember his surname, but he... Gary Warren. Gary Warren. He made some home movie footage of what it was like shooting on this film. And that's online, after the film, if you want to see the sort of thing they were getting up to. And before we watch, I mean, another thing, obviously, we just about Lionel Jeffries. So, Lionel Jeffries, for, for the kids in the audience, was um, a great British actor. You might remember him if you've seen Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. He mm. played Grandpa Potts in that film. And then he uh, bought the rights to Railway Children... And he wrote the screenplay and directed it. And he then went on to direct some other kids' films, like this, The Amazing Mr. Blunden, Wombling Free, and The Water Baby. So he kind of really made a mark in terms of kind of family films, didn't he? Yeah, and I think he understood family films. This is the other thing. Amazing Mr. Blunden, if you like this movie, Amazing Mr. Blunden <coughs> is a terrific film to seek out as well. Lionel Jeffries is actually a very kind of warm personality. And in something like Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, as you say, he's incredibly warm. And yet he'd played everything in his life. He'd played funny sailors, he'd played psychos, he'd played people you fell out with, he'd played funny policemen, you name it. And yet when he comes to make a film, it's like he understands children. And I remember reading a quote from him, he said, I treat children as sawn-off adults. And I think that's absolutely true. He's not making kids' movies in a kid's way. He's making kids' movies that are full of adult themes that kids can understand. And just finally, before we watch the film now, what, what's next for you in terms of, is there more presenting? Have you got other...? Um, well, I've done the music for a massive Robin Hood. Uh, come and see that. Barbican, October the 14th. Douglas Fairbanks, silent film, but with full orchestra, 85-piece orchestra of the BBC SA. Lots of wonderful stunts, just a tremendous piece of work. So Obviously, that's if it's October the 14th, they'll all be at the London Film Festival, so sadly they won't. Yeah, no, uh, but uh, <laughs> thankfully most people will be at Robin Hood that night rather than at the London Film Festival. Um, and then um, there's a telly coming up, which I'll be doing, which is about musical theatre for BBC Four. So that's uh, three one-hours. So there's a lot... A lot going on this year right. at the moment. But I can't tell you how lovely it is to be able to bring this film to a screen and to have such a great audience for it as well. well Wonderful. We're going to move on to the film. I just have to very quickly thank American Express who uh, sponsor this strand. They have been really, really great supporters and uh, we're uh, delighted they continue to support the BFI. Um, but a really, really huge thank you to Neil Brand for being here to present the Railway Children. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. Thank you.